On the evening of November 3rd, 1988, approximately 25 years ago, a graduate student at Cornell University named Robert T. Morris Jr. executed a computer program that inadvertently caused a level of destruction across the internet that would ultimately make it one of the most historic events in the field of cybersecurity. In fact, one could even argue that up until this point, very few people had actually taken cybersecurity seriously and that on the whole, cybersecurity hadn't really been viewed by many as a formal discipline within the broader field of computer science. After all, it's important to keep in mind that in 1988, very few people had even heard of the internet, let alone had any appreciation for the implications of securing it. And to be fair, the internet was very different in 1988. It was primarily used as a tool for academics to share information. The internet in 1988 wasn't really used for things like e-commerce or for online banking as it is today. And so there was a lot less motivation to actually secure the internet. The program that Robert Morris Jr. wrote has come to be referred to as the Morris Worm, and I thought I would do a series of videos that describe the Morris Worm, with this first video being maybe a bit more of an overview. Now I do want to stress that the Morris Worm is very much a historical relic at this point. The original Morris Worm would not propagate or do as much damage today because the technical flaws that it took advantage of to propagate are no longer found on modern systems. Now that being said, the Morris Worm is extremely important from a historical perspective, and in many ways, it was a major impetus behind the development of cybersecurity as a formal field. It really served as a major wake-up call. As soon as the Morris Worm would get onto a system on the internet, it would attempt to connect to and install itself on other hosts that were really connected to that first system. Now, under normal circumstances, it shouldn't really be possible for a computer program running on one system to gain unauthorized access to a different computer and install itself. However, the Morris Worm took advantage of several technical vulnerabilities. In particular, the Worm took advantage of technical vulnerabilities in three Unix programs, and these were number one, the SendMail program, the FingerD program, and also the RSH slash RExec program. Now in the case of the RExec and to a certain degree in the case of RSH, the Morris Swarm was really taking advantage of the fact that many users choose simple passwords. And that was true especially 25 years ago. So the Morris Swarm included a module that tried to guess the passwords in order to gain unauthorized access two user accounts on a system. Now, in order to control the computational resources that were taken up by the worm, Robert Morris Jr. actually put in a very specific check that went like this. If a copy of the worm program arrived on a system that was already running a copy of the worm, then the programs would effectively flip a digital coin and one of them would self-destruct. The result of which is that only one copy of the worm would run on any one given system at any one moment in time. And so as such, the worm wouldn't take up too much in the way of system resources. However, Robert Morris Jr. decided to put in a small bit of code in his worm so that one out of every seven times this self-destruction step would be skipped. And this one nuance, this seemingly tiny degree of replication, ended up making literally all the difference. Gradually, more and more copies of the worm started running on a given system, and these copies sucked up resources on that system. As the system got busier and busier, running more and more instances of the worm, it became less and less able to service regular requests, and basically the system became so bogged down that it was otherwise inoperable. At the time the worm was released, the internet comprised some 60,000 or so systems. And based on very, very loose estimates, over the course of about two days, from November 2nd to November 4th, 1988, about 10% of these systems, about 6,000 systems in total, actually crashed under the weight of being repeatedly infected with the Morris worm. 
Beyond the damage that was caused by multiple copies of the worm taking up system resources, no other parts of the worm, or the worm's code rather, exhibited any destructive behaviors. And the overall evidence seems to suggest that Morris was not motivated by malice. Uh, there clearly is a lot that Robert Morris could have done, given just how many systems the worm infected, and also the kind of access that he had. Rather, the evidence seems to suggest that Morris was driven by curiosity to conduct an experiment that really ended up going awry. Ultimately, Robert Morris Jr. was convicted on a single felony count of violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. And he was actually the first person who was convicted in the United States under this act. His ultimate sentence after appeals was three years of probation, 400 hours of community service, and a $10,000 fine. Since that time, Robert Morris Jr. has gone on to have an illustrious career in technology. He completed his doctorate from Harvard. He went on to join the faculty of MIT, where he's actually now a tenured professor. He was a co-founder of ViaWeb, which was sold to Yahoo in 1998. And in 2005, Robert Morris Jr. was among the founding team of Y Combinator, which is a startup accelerator that is extremely well-known in Silicon Valley. So that's what I wanted to say about the Morris Worm uh, in this video. In subsequent videos, I'll dive into some more details regarding the underlying mechanics and the architecture of the Morris Worm.